if no, for no other reason, it's wonderful to have a meeting like this because it gives me a, a unique opportunity to see Professor Bell in a jacket and tie. <laughs> uh, uh, well, he wasn't even here to hear this. Uh, good morning. I'm Robert Sokol, and the organizing committee has recruited me out of retirement to chair the opening session. We all have three intensive days of meetings ahead of us, but the time should be well spent and well worth it. Judging from the titles of the talks, they represent an accurate cross-section through the field of evolutionary biology. I, for one, look forward eagerly to learning all sorts of new facts and new ideas. Surely this is true for most of the other participants. Now some details about the mechanics of the presentation. Each talk should last no more than 30 minutes. I shall give you a warning sign like this, well, like this, when there's five minutes uh, um, left to permit you to conclude gracefully. After 30 minutes, your time is up, and there will be 10 minutes for discussion. But I should point out to you, because one of the speakers this morning dropped out, the fourth speaker is being promoted to be the third speaker, and the entire four speakers' time uh, is then used up, for, used up for a one-hour discussion period, which will discuss all three papers and any other relevant subjects in evolutionary biology that people want to bring up that is connected with what has been said this morning. Um, I think that's all, other than remind you again, in the discussion, uh, please speak your name first, otherwise we won't know what immortal words were said by whom uh, at the end of the session. Um, I said earlier that most of us look forward to learning new facts and ideas. However, our first speaker, Douglas J. Fatuma, is a notable exception. He knows it all already. I do not believe I'm, in, <laughs> I'm indulging in local chauvinism if I call him the evolutionist par excellence of the current generation. Doug teaches in the Department of Ecology and Evolution at Stony Brook, and he will speak to us this morning on evolutionary biology, 150 years of progress. Doug. I guess I'm supposed to turn on this microphone. Um, uh, I was prepared to say in my opening sentence that it is really a great honor to be introduced by my friend and very, very esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Sokol. I was not expecting that he would say something so um, outrageous <laughs> and embarrassing. Um, how, do we t how do we call up this uh, pre presentation? I see a blank screen here. and. I'm kind of, oh, there it is. Oh, all right, okay, got it. Um, so um, um, uh, we sort of conceived this meeting. This is perhaps a, a rather hackneyed conceit. You can ima imagine it's New Year's Eve, and we, are, uh, we, begin, we begin the evening essentially by saying goodbye to the old year. That is to say, looking, looking back to see where we've come, you know, wh 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 what path we've traversed to reach the point at which we are now. And the, uh, and the, the, uh, the meeting will, will conclude uh, with the, the, uh, the bright cherubic face of the, of the future. Um, and uh, so my role is um, uh, to basically be the slightly gray-haired individual looking back uh, over the last 150 years. But in the 30 minutes that Bob has given me, um, I cr can't really talk about everything that's happened in the last 150, so I propose instead to limit myself almost entirely um, to the last 50 years, that is to say since the last Darwin, big Darwin celebration in 1959, which was celebrated again by several symposium meetings, most notably those um, at Chicago and at Cold Spring Harbor. 
Um, now, that year, 1959, I realized as I began to think about what this talk would, would amount to, that was the year in which I graduated from high school and entered college and took my first formal biology courses in which I started to get my first formal education about evolution. And um, so that's 50 years ago. Uh, I would like to think that my career is not quite entirely over yet. And what that means then is that one career, around, um, in one scientific career, amounts to about a third of the time that has elapsed since the origin of species. There have really only been three scientific careers worth of time since then. Um, and that, you know, when that, to me, puts into perspective the amazing amount of change that has happened in a rather short amount of scientific time, so to speak. Um, and uh, graduate students take note. Just think of what you will be looking back on when you attend the next Darwin celebrations 50 years from now, presumably presenting in them, and just think of how primitive the state of evolutionary biology today will look to you at that point in time. Well, that, of course, is the way the state of evolutionary biology 50 years ago looked. It looks from our current perspective. In 1959, the main topics of, con of concern and conversation were, in essence, evolutionary biology as it had matured and been synthesized during the evolutionary synthesis, um, led by these figures. Um, and the major themes, just to remind what all of us know, um, the major themes of the evolutionary synthesis um, were the random nature of mutation giving rise to genetic variation, the empirical discovery that there was a lot of genetic variation in natural populations, although no one really knew why, the, um, the theory of population genetics that had been developed in which the uh, reigning, uh, the reigning part of that theory, the, 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 the uh, crown of that theory was a reaffirmation, a, re a renaissance of Darwin's notion of natural selection and its re-enthronement as the centerpiece, the main, um, uh, the main agent of adaptive evolution. Um, uh, the, uh, the reaffirmation of Darwin's gradualism, the, the proposition that, that advantageous mutations usually have small phenotypic effects, uh, that evolution does not pr uh, proceed by major saltations. Um, a focus on species in which the, the, uh, they were uh, uh, defined, uh, more or less, uh, more or less, not universally, but uh, general consensus that they could, should be considered reproductively isolated sets of populations, and that they arise by allopatric divergence of populations, due presumably to natural selection stemming from the environment, although Ernst Meyer added the founder effect um, as an additional factor. Um, and then finally, um, under the leadership of George Gaylord Simpson in paleobiology and Bernhard Rentsch, an insufficiently appreciated figure in comparative morphology, the conclusion that macroevolution, evolutionary patterns above the species level, need not be explained by the various uh, heretical ideas that had been prevalent in, among some paleontologists, but rather could be entirely explained by the processes um, at the population level uh, that, uh, that are foregoing on this list. Now, I would like, especially for graduate students, um, to uh, amaze you. I want you to think of what evolutionary biology was like in 1959. Well, for one thing, there weren't any DNA sequences. There were some protein sequences, but no DNA sequences. This is only six years after Watson and Crick's you know, uh, model. Okay? And so molecular biology was in its infancy. Um, I think it's the case that the, uh, that the genetic code was still being worked out. I've, I've, I, I beg correction on that, which incidentally, of course, I'm not a historian. And so I will appreciate any comments or corrections on what I have to say before I really finally write it down for the book. Um, uh, any suggestions at all? Um, and an important consequence of this is that there were very, very few molecular markers. And in general, there were very few polymorphisms um, that could be attributed to segregating alleles, the identifiable segregating alleles. Um, There's a few morphological polymorphisms and not many others. And so the consequence of this was that most population genetic theory really couldn't be applied in practice because you couldn't identify segregating alleles and look at their frequencies. Um, and so, um, so we're looking at a very different state of affairs. 
um, people weren't, you know, weren't in uh, working out phylogenies um, by uh, by computer analysis of of uh, DNA sequences or even morphology. The <coughs> computers were in a very primitive state, for one thing. The first computer simulations in evolutionary biology, I think, were around 1960, uh, Lewinton and White. Um, and, of course, there weren't any explicit phy phylogenetic algorithms. Um, Hennig's book, The Grundzüge der Phylogenetischen Systematik, had not yet been, but yet been translated into English, so his ideas were very little known. And so the entire field of phylogenetics is something that, in effect, um, had developed after 1959. Um, finally, although there were some field studies of natural selection, they were rather few compared to what we can look at, to, can point to today. And certainly at that time, there was very little convincing evidence of genetic drift. So what I want to do in the next <coughs> um, short period is to survey ever so superficially a few of the major fields in evolutionary biology. I'm pointing to what I see as some of the major accomplishments since 1959, bearing in mind, please, that this is a very personal perspective. It is probably a, an, an excessively American perspective because I'm an American. Um, and again, I invite commentary and, and correction and amplification. Um, so turning first to evolutionary genetics, in which uh, first here are a few of the, um, of the uh, players, the since, uh, major players since uh, 1959, um, what are some of the major advances? Well, um, one, for one thing, um, oh, where's the projection? Has there not been a projection all this time? What? What did I do? Excuse me? Okay. Oh dear, okay. Let's see if this works. Okay, I'm not turning it off. Um, so, so in any case, so what, are we, what are some of the advances in evolutionary genetics? Well, for one thing, a lot more study of natural selection in natural populations, okay? So this is already a fairly old graph from Endor's book, which is a distribution of selection coefficients estimated in nature just on the basis of reproductive differences, not even including studies of, more, of, uh, of viability. And of course, what we have then is a very, very, very large number of estimates of selection um, and showing the great range of values, very often one could detect quite strong selection in nature. Um, so again, affirming the importance of natural selection. Secondly, of course, especially beginning in 1966, the development of, of techniques for visualizing uh, genetic variation at the molecular level, beginning, of course, first with alizymes um, and followed uh, by <coughs> Marty Kreitman's work on DNA sequence variation, um, opening, of course, the great flood of studies um, on genetic variation in nature. And so this, again, following through on what I had just said, enabled the application of population genetic theory to natural populations, looking at patterns of population structure, inferring gene flow, in some instances inferring uh, the, uh, the operation of selection or drift. Um, speaking of which, of course, one of the major, really uh, major alt events in the history of evolutionary biology, I would say, is the development of the neutral theory introduced by Kimura, the nearly neutral theory developed by Ota, um, and its application to molecular data. Um, and uh, then with many of which seem to support the neutral theory. And of course, one, this had grown partly out of Kimura's uh, uh, observation, which preceded by Tsuka Kondo and Pauling, Pauling that, um, that there appeared to be relatively constant rates of sequence evolution, uh, giving rise to the concept of a molecular clock. Um, and this really is, however, however contentious and however inexact it may be, it is still a major event in the history of evolutionary biology to have a, even inexact dating of uh, events in the past, divergences in the past, um, which uh, were uh, very poorly or not at all uh, recorded in the fossil record. Um, finally, of course, more recent uh, uh, advances that I need not uh, detail um, in evolutionary genetics include the development of coalescent theory um, and its application to a whole variety of questions about population history and selection. 
the, the use of molecular markers to be able to identify QTL, quantitative trait loci. If you go back into the 1970s and ask how could one estimate the number of loci that contribute to variation in a quantitative trait, the methods were entirely statistical and extremely inexact, I think everyone, in fact they were just guesses. I think it's fair to say. Um, now they're better guesses. We, it's still hard to pin down all the loci, but nevertheless, we're in a much better position than ever before to say something about the characteristics of the polygenes that contribute to uh, variation within and among species. And this approach, together with the use of candidate genes, um, leads us into the ability often to identify specific genes that contribute to important phenotypic characters, um, as illustrated by uh, this uh, uh, polymorphism in a paramiscus species based on the melanocortin 1 receptor, and I suspect this is not the last time we will see this picture. Right, Hopi? Okay. Maybe. Um, uh, and then, of course, finally, uh, just a nod toward genomics. We are embarking, of course, on a whole new era in evolutionary biology uh, when we get into comparative genomics. Um, the other new directions that I would just mention that I think, uh, I think are we, we sure we will be talking about here in the next several days include a new emphasis on the origin of variation. Um, when I was a student and for most of my career, by and large mutation was a neglected factor in evolution. Um, it's um, the importance of rates and kinds of mutation, I think, was pretty much just we were silent on the subject. That has now been reopened as part of an increasing focus on genetic constraints and genetic biases, and in some instances, questions about whether genetic variation really is as sufficient for rapid adaptation as we've been, uh, as we have believed for a long time. And so this together amounts to a focus on what several people like Günther Wagner have called evolvability, the capacity, the potential of populations to evolve adaptively. I have, for each of these major areas, worked, uh, you know, written down a list of questions that occurred to me as I was thinking about these, and I've been presumptuous enough to put them down into a handout that I will distribute uh, afterward, just in case anyone is, has nothing better to do with their time than to look at some of these questions. But for instance, I'd be curious to discuss why mutation was neglected as a factor of, of evolution, why population genetics didn't really address um, specific adaptive questions very broadly until the 1960s, um, which is the theme of the next topic that I go to, which is that a, what George Williams uh, uh, hoped for, what he called a science of adaptation, um, was intimated before the 1960s, but by and large started maturing at that time, um, these being some of the major players. Uh, this is especially uh, uh, behavioral ecology is a major part of this, um, but of course many other areas as well. What we are concerned with here is the fact that the, during the, 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 the evolutionary synthesis, there had been developed a very sophisticated theory of selection, but it was an extremely general theory that simply said, let there be selective coefficients applied to genotypes with no specification whatever of what kinds of phenotypes those genotypes might underlie. Um, what we had instead now, beginning partly in response to Wynne Edwards's claim for, for group selection, there was attention drawn to the role of individual selection, hence to levels of selection, um, a, focus, a, a, uh, a focus on individual selection especially as being the, the main level at which natural selection works. This was a major thrust of George Williams's book, a major thrust of work by Maynard Smith and others. Um, and this then led into, th into individual selectionist thinking about a variety of kinds of puzzling characters of organisms. And so you have the development of other approaches to, to uh, understanding specific kinds of adaptations, the development of optimality theory, of the ESS theory, and the development of, of models, specific bodies of models for such characteristics as life history features, behavior, including a, a, a growing emphasis on sexual selection that greatly neglected, entirely neglected, really, almost uh, between Darwin's time and the 1980s. Um, uh, interest in genetic systems such as the advantages of sexual versus asexual reproduction. And so a whole body of focus on explaining particular classes of characters of organisms um, that really only started developing in the 1960s. Okay. Another a major theme of the evolutionary synthesis had been speciation. 
again with the perhaps led by Dobzhansky, Meyer, and Stebbins, with Im very important uh, later contributions by many other people, some of whom are pictured here. Um, and there have been major, major advances in the study of speciation. Um, possibly among the most important being the development of population genetic models, of mathematical models. Before the 1960s, there was almost no explicit modeling of the speciation process. It was by and large verbal, verbal models. Um, and the development of, of models of reinforcement of the conditions for sympatric speciation, of the conditions for founder effect speciation, and many other features is really a major advance because it really started telling us what was likely and what was unlikely and giving us ideas of what to look for in nature. Um, there has been an increasing appreciation of the fact that you know, the entire genome doesn't diverge at the same rate. There are going to be regions of the genome that are divergently selected and hence diverge among speciating populations, while other regions of the genome may continue to intergress rather freely for long periods of time. And this is a relatively um, uh, new, new uh, way of thinking. A lot of, of, uh, of uh, you know, progress on the genetics of species differences, basically ta taking techniques developed first by Dobzhansky and, and elaborating them uh, increasingly, especially as we get more and more um, <coughs> capacity to look into genomes. Um, and then finally and importantly, it is really quite astonishing that up until extremely recently, we had essentially no evidence at all for the origin of species by means of natural selection, a phrase that may be familiar to you. That is to say, it was presumed that speciation was largely due to natural selection, but in almost no instances had that been convincingly uh, demonstrated and really hardly investigated at all. And it's only in the very recent past, the last 15 years, let's say, in which the evidence has begin, begun to accrue for the role both of divergent ecological selection and of sexual selection. And, but the, the, it is still the case that there's really only, only a handful or so of really good studies of the agent, the main agent of speciation. Um, finally, how am I doing on time here? Um, um, <clears throat> finally, I want to turn to the very broad topic of the study of evolutionary history and macroevolution. And I think this is one of the most satisfying developments in evolutionary biology. It may have been the case during the evolutionary synthesis that, uh, that everyone, or at least a lot of significant or prominent people, agreed that there was a harmony between microevolutionary processes and macroevolutionary patterns revealed by systematics and, paleo and paleontology. But the reality was that I think most people then went back to, be, to focusing on their particular area of, of, of uh, study. By and large, I, sus I think I can safely say that people in systematics and paleo paleontology tended not to be very conversant in population genetics, and to a considerable extent, the reverse held true as well. Um, and so there, there be developed really great gulfs between, between, these, between these approaches. And I'm thinking especially of an infamous meeting in Chicago in 1980, 1981, right, Joel, that uh, Joel Craycraft uh, co-organized, co um, in which, uh, which was intended to be a kind of exploration of the, the uh, macroevolution and its, its microevolutionary bases, in which um, basically people almost came to blows. I mean, there was really, really deep rifts at that time, to the point where the, 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 the volume for that was anticipated coming out of that meeting uh, never happened. Um, and in 1986, when I was president of the, of the SSE, um, uh, for that I gave a, you know, my presidential talk on what I called Sturm und Drang, storm and stress, and the evolutionary synthesis about what I perceived to be this great rift uh, within the sort of between two halves of evolutionary biology. Well, I think to a very large extent that rift has been bridged. I think there's much less of a rift now than there was then. Um, and let's, and uh, that uh, owes, <coughs> that has several, several reasons. Now, um, I am really not qualified to talk at all about advances in paleontology, um, and, uh, and, but I will just, again, from my own very provincial perspective, point to what I see as a few of the major advances. One being kind of a resurrection of, of what was really Simpson's approach, um, that is a focus not on description of individual events, um, uh, but rather on general patterns in the fossil record. What uh, David Raup and co-authors uh, called in one or two papers, no nomothetic, 
law-based uh, law, law, you know, law um, paleobiology. There was an increasing concern with patterns of diversity, but diversification in the fossil record. Um, there was, of course, the great big event of the, uh, starting in 1972, Eldridge and Gould's postulate of punctuated equilibrium, in which they suggested that patterns of abrupt change in lineages were, uh, bespoke the requirement for speciation. Um, that is, they said morphological uh, change depends on speciation and invoked um, the notion of genetic revolutions that Meyer had po postulated together with his founder effect. This, of course, set up enormous debates. No population geneticist accepted this point of view at all. And although it is extremely contentious and perhaps damaging in some ways, in the end, I think it was a salutary debate because, uh, for one thing, it uh, made uh, um, population geneticists more aware of really interesting and important paleontological phenomena, especially stasis. Um, and on the other hand, it also led to an exploration of models of speciation, especially founder effect speciation. Um, um, and it led, I think, to the appreciation on both sides of what the other had to offer, to at least some extent. Um, and, and in general, one of the things that emerged uh, during this period was an increasing assertion by paleobiologists, an assertion of the importance of a historical perspective. You would think that, our, that people in our field, of any field in biology, that evolutionary biologists would be most conscious of the importance of history, historical contingency, and so on. But the reality is that many evolutionary biologists did not have that perspective. And the increasing insistence by very vocal paleobiologists, I think, really helped to bring that about. There were also, of course, uh, factors ha happening in geology per se that had very important consequences. Be I mean, it, when I was an undergraduate, that's when plate tectonics came to be accepted by, by geologists. Okay. So this is, yeah, I mean, it obviously had enormous, enormous implications. Um, and again, when I was a graduate student, I think it was then that the Alvarez's postulated that uh, the KT extinction had been caused by an asteroid or a bolide impact. Uh, you know, again, the notion of catastrophic events playing right major roles in evolutionary history being revived after a very long period of time. And so the consequence of this, this, I think, is that a lot of the Sturm und Drang has sort of dissipated, has diminished over time, and paleobiologists have felt themselves, as they put it, um, invited back to the high table of evolutionary biology. Um, in a very large, very large topic indeed, um, has to do with the development of phylogenetic systematics. Um, and I have to say that being at Stony Brook, I have a very particular and personal viewpoint on uh, what was happening at that time. Um, again, at the top, I have pictured some of the major figures that played a role here. Um, and of course, the, you know, the number one event really is the development of conceptual models for phylogenetic inference. Um, at first, relatively, you know, I would say fairly, relatively simple models becoming shall we say, more sophisticated over time, especially with the uh, Joel Felsenstein and later others insisting on the importance of statistical um, uh, uh, approaches and methods to be able to judge the reliability of, uh, of phylogenetic inferences. And then later, the use of models of, evolu of, of evolution, specifically of DNA sequence evolution, as a, an important component of phylogenetic inference. Um, one of the things that happened, of course, to some extent, you started getting crossover between people in phylogenetics and people in population genetics. So you have people like Felsenstein, of course, and Masatoshi Ne, and a number of others, you know, in which there, basically you start getting a certain amount of, of interchange and dialogue between these two, these two realms of interest. Um, and finally, then, it becomes recognized that some familiarity with population genetics is absolutely essential if you're going to do phylogenetics, especially at the species and population level. You've really got to have a you know, concept of, uh, basic concepts of coalescent theory and of neutral theory, for example. And then finally, what grows out of this is that methods originally envisioned as a way of, of determining relationships among species, among taxa, turn out, of course, to be useful in many other contexts as well. And so we, we now can study gene trees, population histories, um, and of course now uh, many aspects of genomics are, are in, you know, inextric inextricably tied up with phylogeny. And so the consequence of all this is that we really have phylogenies today that we can have immensely more confidence in than I think we did by and large in, let's say, the 1960s. 
Um, there's been a resurgence, again, of a historical perspective. And so, for instance, historical biogeography has re-emerged as a discipline, a much stronger discipline than it ever was in the pre-phylogenetic past. Um, that phylogenies are used for testing many, many kinds of hypotheses in evolution. There's been an increasing respect for, if not systematics as a whole, then certainly phylogenetics by the community of evolutionary biologists and many other biologists as well. And as I said earlier, um, uh, together with paleobiology, a renewed appreciation of history. And so we can celebrate what I think is astonishing progress, um, uh, as has as been the case in biology uh, generally, of course, astonishing progress in the last 50 years based on the development of new theory and concepts, based on te uh, technological advance, based, very importantly, on advances in molecular biology and developmental biology, based, I think, on the broader education of evolutionary biologists recently compared to, let's say, back in the 60s. Um, and so evolution and, and evolutionary biology is also enjoying greater respect, I think, within biology as a whole than ever before. But, um, but throughout this time, there have been repeated claims that the evolutionary synthesis is dead. Okay, just to take perhaps, perhaps one of the best known and perhaps most outrageous of these was a paper that Steve Gould published in 1980, a very famous paper in which he said, I have been watching the synthetic theory slowly un unravel. Um, and the, this theory as a general proposition is effectively dead. Um, and so people are continually, I think, claiming that it's time for a paradigm shift, um, a much abused word. Uh, and of course, the term was introduced by Thomas Kuhn. And my understanding of what he meant was an abrupt transformation of scientific inquiry when the science reaches a crisis due to failure of the reigning paradigm to accommodate data. So I would, in, in closing, like to consider just a few of the challenges to the synthetic theory of the claims that the synthetic theory needed major uh, alteration. Um, I'll pass over number one. There were a couple of what I think were sort of uh, somewhat silly things that said by a few people in phylogenetics. Um, and move on to the, the fact that some developmental biologists then and possibly even now have claimed that phenotypes can be understood best not so much as the result of natural selection as the consequence of, a right, of intrinsic laws of form rooted in physical processes. Um, and um, and uh, this is Brian Goodwin, I have a quote from, uh, and, um, and I think that in fact, there are very interesting studies of the physics of cells and of, of cell membranes and so forth. But of course, the proteins, gene products that make cells and make cells do things, they obviously have to operate through physical processes. So you must be able to provide physical descriptions of development and so on. But those physical events are what's, what the proteins are doing and subject to the laws of physics. And presumably, if you change the gene products, you can change the actual physical events that are happening. So there are, what we have here, I think, is a, is a confounding of very proximate versus more ultimate uh, um, uh, explanation. Um, and I think, no, I think none of us uh, really accept this particular point of view. But in the developmental realm, realm we have what is now being called epigenesis, um, not the way Waddington meant that, intended that word. Um, the phenomenon of genetic assimilation and a related phenomenon uh, called, uh, by Mary Jane West Everhard called genetic accommodation, in which the idea is that phenotypically plastic responses to environments come first and then may be entrained in, in, into the genome. Um, and the claim has been made by uh, my uh, former colleague, Massimo Pellucci, um, who was supposed to organize this meeting, um, uh, that uh, what we require uh, uh, to accommodate these new perspectives is a new and expanded evolutionary synthesis. Um, genetic assimilation, of course, isn't very old laboratory phenomenon, okay? And I think we understand quite well what, the, what its basis is, and it certainly fits well within the synthetic theory. I have been watching, every, you know, because I write textbooks, I've been watching for convincing examples of genetic assimilation in natural populations. And if anyone can provide, and can tell me one, I would love to know it. So far, as far as I know, it remains a phenomenon documented in the, in the laboratory. If we did find it operating in the field, it still would not violate the synthetic theory. But the fact is, you know, let's find, let's, let's actually find some, some, some real cases. 
Um, so it, it is, this is, you know, potentially these factors may be operating, but it's not clear to me that even if they do turn out to be important, which remains to be demonstrated, that they would really require very much more than what we have now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there of course had been the challenge to, Dar to natural selection in the Darwinian sense of uh, selection at the individual or gene level. And while there are still a few um, individuals, some of whom I greatly respect, David Sloan Wilson is still fighting a fairly lone battle uh, for group selection. And so far, this, um, uh, uh, this um, challenge to the Darwinian hegemony um, hasn't really had too many buyers. Um, I've referred already to punctuated equilibrium and uh, trends arising from species selection. Um, and there's a great deal to be said here. Um, Eldridge and Gould, remember, originally postulated that speciation was necessary for genomes to be shaken up enough that they would respond to selection. Um, finally, both of them abandoned that uh, com you know, completely. Um, and, uh, and so I think there, there, are other, there are other possible explanations for the phenomena that they described in the fossil record, um, one of which I've uh, sort of suggested myself. Um, and, uh, and then consequently, species selection, although everyone agrees that there are differences in pr the proliferation of clades that in some instances could be called species selection, they clearly are not required to explain all uh, evolutionary trends in morphology. Um, the question persists as to whether or not all of evolution is truly gradual, consisting of the succession of many, many very small changes, or whether it's due to macro mutations. I think that one person's macro mutation is another person's micro mutation. Um, certainly, I think we all agree that there's no evidence for macro mutations in a Goldschmidtian sense of causing really major alterations of body plan. Um, if anyone disagrees with that, then let's definitely talk about it. But of course, we do know that among the many genes that contribute to most phenotypic traits, some of them do have larger effects than others, and some of those may use, some of those individual loci may account for a considerable fraction of the variance. Whether those should be called uh, macro mutations or not, I think really is a matter of opinion. I think that if there's one change, one uh, in evolutionary theory in the last 50 years that could possibly deserve the name of paradigm shift, it is the neutral theory. Um, there is no question that when this was first advanced, this non-Darwinian evolution was simply viewed as heretical, I think, by the great majority of, of people. And so I will leave you there with the, the, the possibility that that is the one and only paradigm shift. Of course, there are many molecular discoveries that uh, may or may not constitute any sort of challenge to our understanding. It's been claimed that transposable elements and biased gene conversions and, and so on require us to, uh, to change our way of thinking. Um, but I would be interested to know if anyone agrees that they do. Um, finally, just to end with Darwin. If in the light of all of this, you go back and reread The Origin of Species, you of course won't find all of this there because he didn't know about genes. But it is amazing, it is amazing how many different things Darwin turned his attention to. And you can go through all of these, and in so many instances, in some instances, you find that, well, yeah, we've, you know, he wasn't really quite totally on, right on. You know, phylogeny, the tree of life, isn't always and everywhere just branching. There's some reticulation here and there, especially among pro prokaryotes. But, you know, on the whole, he was pretty much right. There's only one instance in which I think he was just wrong, and that was that he, and, you know, he accepted some degree of inheritance of, of acquired characters. Um, otherwise, you go down through that list and you say, what an amazing man. He thought of so many different things, and on almost all of them, his insights were basically right. So um, we celebrate his uh, accomplishments today. Thanks very much. Thank you.